the Triathlon Show 289. What's up, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of That Triathlon Show, the podcast presented by scientifictriathlon.com. I'm your host, Michael, and on today's episode, I interview Val Burke. Val is a New Zealand-based triathlon and endurance sports coach with a background in exercise science and physiology. She coaches age group athletes, but also some high-level professionals, with perhaps the most well-known being a New Zealand professional triathlete, Braden Curry. In this interview with Val, we go into a number of interesting topics, including just for example, strength training for triathletes and how to find your race target paces and powers, as well as how to set your training zones based on metabolic testing and lots of other things. So stay tuned for that. But just before, big thanks to our sponsors, Roka, that you can find on roka.com. Roka are the leading manufacturers of wetsuits, trisuits, swimskins, goggles, and high performance eyewear and prescription glasses and sunglasses. And in those latter categories, the eyewear, whether we talk about prescription or just regular sunglasses, they have a number of features that I want to highlight and mention. For example, the frames are all ultra lightweight, so you can barely feel them on your face. They all have adjustable features, so you can make them fit your face shape perfectly. They have Geeko anti-slip technology, so they will never fall off your face. In the actual purchasing process, the Roka has virtual try-on options on their website, and they have an online vision test that you can use to update your prescription in 15 minutes. They have home try-on options. This is US only, and you can try up to four pairs at home for up to seven days. Also, they have blue light blocking coding for the lenses, so that's another really cool feature to allow you to to really maximize your sleep quality and ability to to fall asleep by reducing blue light late in the day you can find all of this information and much much more on roca.com and uh, you can get 20 percent off your roca order with the promo code that you can get on roca.com for slash tts and it applies to all roca products and thank you to Zen8 that you can find on zen8swimtrainer.com. The Zen8 Swim Trainer helps time crunch athletes get more consistency in their swim training uh, because you can get uh, a more frequent, uh, more frequent stimulus of training by doing short but effective home-based workouts to complement your pool or open water swimming. Even in just 15 to 20 minutes, you can get a high quality session done with a focus on either power or stamina or technique. And the Zen8 Swim Trainer will help you do that. It can help you work on technical elements such as activating your core because of the instability element of the swim bench and it can help you get into that high elbow catch position easier because of the design of the swim bench in terms of the height of it. You can also deflate the bench. It's not big and bulky. It's also not very costly at all. It's uh, similar to a pair of good running shoes and you can get it for 20% off your entire order when you use the discount code that you can get on senateswimtrainer.com forward slash TTS. Now, one final uh, thing before we get into the interview. If you are a long time listener and you enjoy the podcast, please rate and review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts and can rate and review. That really helps a lot. And now, without any further ado, let's get into the interview with Coach Val Burke. Today's guest on that triathlon show is Val Burke. Val, uh, welcome. How are you doing? Hello, good. Thank you very much. Yep, we're good down in New Zealand. Awesome. Uh, let's start by you just introducing yourself and telling the audience a bit more about yourself and your background in endurance sports. Okay, well, I'm Canadian. I grew up in northern BC, British Columbia in Canada, and I played all sports, including competitive swimming, but basketball was actually my main sport and I ended up going to university in British Columbia playing basketball and we played through Canada and the States and I did a phys ed and biology degree. That was in 1986 I started that. Um, Finished basketball because in North America you get four to five years and then you're out the other side. So at that point triathlon started coming in and I was, I didn't know, to me, it seemed like such an amazing sport that I didn't know if people could actually do it. It seemed like one of those amazing sports. So I, I did my first, it was a sprint try. 
did my first sprint try in 1991, um, realized it actually wasn't as difficult as everyone said. It was about the same as playing 40 minutes of basketball as far as the lactate headache you got afterwards and how hard you worked. Um, but after that, I moved to New Zealand in 1995, finished my degree in Canada, but I wanted to know more. So when I was in New Zealand, I did a master's degree in exercise physiology at the University of Otago. And I was luckily, luck, very lucky to have a supervisor who's named Dr. Gord Sleevert, who was possibly one of the most amazing applied sports scientists I'd ever worked with. And Gord was very popular and he got lots of roles with many of the New Zealand squads. And I told Gord I wanted to do a master's in epidemiology because I didn't want to do a master's to see if, spend three years to see if someone could jump a centimeter higher, but I wanted to change the world with my master's study, but I wanted to work with elite athletes. So um, that's what I did with my master's. It was actually a very big study on heart disease and uh, spinal injuries. And um, But then Gord gave me a lot of work dealing with elite athletes alongside that. So the other thing while I was there, I was doing triathlon that whole time myself, and I was still involved with basketball, but we had lots of research going on in the university, so I became a subject in every single study I could. So I learned a lot. I had muscle biopsies taken. I had rectal thermistors. I, we had a, a performance lab. Um, I swam in the flume, and it was actually amazing just to be a, a, um, a research um not assistant, sorry, but actually a subject to actually get to know what it's really like from that perspective. But at the same time, I was also, I got quite a few research assistant grants. So I started doing a bit of research myself. So it was good to be on both sides of that. Um, after I finished my master's, I um, was, I had a job in the performance labs. They're called the Human Performance Center. And at that stage, my title was called a sports scientist, which sounded really impressive. But essentially what I did was we did a little bit of research, applied um, exercise physiology research, but I also was a lead strength and conditioner for Basketball New Zealand, as well as um, working under Gord with Bike New Zealand. We did a lot of their physiological testing, and we basically tested any athletes in the South Island um, and really expanded the research um, of athletes and we did performance camps with them as well. So we did that um, till about 1995 and then we went back to Canada. I had twins by that stage. So we went back to Canada not for um, not for my career development but for other reasons. And at that stage there is no university so I started my own business um, and it was uh, being an endurance coach. And I mainly started that because I wanted to keep fit while I had young children. But I also had lots of experience at that stage observing elite cyclists, elite triathletes, elite runners. I'd been a triathlete myself for about seven years, and I thought it was ready to start. I was ready to start coaching. So at that stage, I combined, I took a lot of the testing I had learned at the University of Otago, and I started testing the athletes I coached three times a year. I also worked with Team Whistler was uh, mostly mountain bikers, but they also did a bit of road riding. And so I, because I was very interested, I'd run testing, bike testing on them in the lab, but then I'd also run them through 20K time trials. And then I'd also correlate their results to the anaerobic threshold power to weight ratio, just for a little bit of fun and to get to know, um, just to get to learn a little bit more. So while I was in Whistler, I was there from 2001 to 2007, and I mostly worked with age groupers, um, sprint distance, Olympic distance, and then, of course, people were starting to do more Ironman at that stage. I worked with Nordic skiing as well, um, and after a few years, I picked up a professional cyclist who raced in Canada, in the States, in Europe, um, in Belgium as well, which I... So I got quite a lot of experience working with him. I also worked with a ski redondier, so she did all the World Cups in Europe. Um, a lot of our cyclists did Cape Epic, La Ruta. Some of our runners did the Marathon de Sables, the Golby Desert uh, Crossing. So got a lot of experience in that regard. But in 2007, we moved back to New Zealand. 
with the family. By then, we had three kids under the age of three, so they were growing up. Um, and I got back into working with New Zealand sports. So from 2000 uh, up to 2010, I was the lead strength for Snow Sports New Zealand, working with the carded skiers and snow um, athletes, skiers, and as well as the lead strength for Tri New Zealand. Um, I had my own business at that stage, coaching endurance athletes, and it just got a bit much. So I dropped my lead positions just to focus on my athletes. But I was also the reg regional youth coach for Tri New Zealand with um, Tri Development. Um, and basically, I've just let go a lot of my contracts and really just focused on coaching, uh, which was my love in the first place. But with the coaching, I've put together a lot of strength. I've got some pretty good experience working with strength training for triathletes, um, as well as I've continued testing them along the way. So I've been very lucky and I've got to um, put a lot of the sports science together with the overall coaching and I've, I've worked with some amazing athletes. Yeah, that, that is a fantastic uh, overview and uh, such a varied background uh, with a lot of experience. Um, can you tell us uh, who are some of the, the athletes you're working with now that the listeners might uh, might be aware of because you, you do have some uh, some pretty high level pros that you're working with. Yeah, um, I suppose now most uh, many tri uh, long distance triathletes will know who Braden Curry is, and he is he was seventh in Kona, the last Kona, fifth the year before, and he's ranked eleventh in the on the PTO circuit. Although with COVID, he's been. Uh, he stayed in New Zealand, but he's uh, just about to go overseas shortly. So I've worked with Braden now for about two and a half years. Um, in the strength area, I've had the pleasure of working with a runner, an ultra runner, um, Ruth Croft. And so I've just, not her overall coaching, but just I've worked in the strength area with her. She had some sort of, I suppose, some stress issues, stress fractures. Um, so she's been really good for the last few years. And Another athlete I've worked with in the strength conditioning is actually a skier who was quite injured um, with labral tears, lesions, uh, basically a lot of crashes along the way. And that's James Woodsy Woods. And he's managed to get back into the scene, win another X Games medal, go to another Olympics. And so that's where my strength has taken me. Um, yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Um so I'm going to go into strength training very soon with you because I do want to discuss that since that's uh, something that you have a lot of uh, a lot of experience in. But before we go, that just a general question for uh, amateur triathletes and endurance athletes listening to this podcast: uh, What would your top three pieces of advice for this demographic be? And it can be anything. Yeah, I think it's a hard one because you can get very technical. And of course, every country I've noted working between Canada, the United States and New Zealand, the athletes are quite different. But in general, what I'd say if we look at meat and potatoes, um, I, of, I often talk about meat and potatoes versus rocket science. And if we look at the meat and potatoes, I really think the best thing you can do is find a good coach um, that you get along well with, put your trust in the coach and follow the program. And it seems very obvious, but a lot, not a lot of athletes uh, always do that. If the program doesn't work, then you go back to your coach and you review it. Um, try not to sneak extra training in or change the rules as you go. Um, the other one I'd say, as in the meat and potatoes category, is book recovery into your training. So a lot of us book training, but then we don't book the recovery, and that might get missed, and you need the recovery in order to absorb the training. Um, and also plan your nutrition, not only your post-training and race nutrition, but um, make sure you put some thought into what you're going to be, how you're going to be feeling yourself over the week. So in the meat and potatoes, endurance training is primary, but I am a bit biased. I'd say strength and range is also, uh, it can be a game changer for a lot of athletes. Well, if we look at... Let, let's Sorry. get into that then. Uh, can can okay. you tell us more more about the strength and range and uh, and how you how you think that that should be incorporated in an in an endurance training program? So, I started looking at started um, strength work with runners and triathletes in two thousand two, 
Um, and I think a lot of the question is, what actually do we mean by strength training? Because if you look at traditional strength coaches, they will probably have a different idea of strength training than the physios and the osteos will. And I've taken an approach that crosses both of those um, both of those areas. So if I look at um, if I look at anecdotal information, so what I found since since 2002, and I didn't go into this thinking it was going to um, be the end all be all for triathletes. But what I noticed over the years from putting it in is that a lot of their niggles just cleared up and they were able to train without the, you know, the week off or the six weeks off or just all those little niggles that we often deal with. Um, backs, calf strength, knees and hamstrings being some of them. I also noticed the injury rates dropped. Um, their performance run and bike went up with less run and bike volume. So I could take someone who maybe was running six days a week, maybe run into some issues. I could take them and have them run four to five times a week, put strength in, and their run performance actually went up alongside that. Um, athletes reported feeling stronger. Runners felt better. Um, and cyclists found that they climbed better. And technically, they could mountain bikers could just roll over routes and things that they couldn't in the past. So that's the sort of anecdotal information. Um, and the research supports that. And I don't, I'm happy to talk about what the research is showing, but I think um, enough of us can do reviews to actually see it supports it quite well. Yeah, no, we, we don't need to go into that. I think it, we have covered it quite a number of times on the podcast before. Uh, so, so let's perhaps get into uh, how you would apply it in, in a triathlon program. Things like you mentioned there that you you're sort of uh, taking part, parts from both a traditional strength coach but also from the physios and the osteos so so what sort of what does a strength routine or workout look like in your mind and how to incorporate that with the swim bike and run training yes so i tend to work more with bike running um when i look at the strength side because there's only so much time most athletes will be happy spending about an hour in the gym, 45 minutes to an hour. And I find they get a lot more value of looking really more on core and lower body. So what I tend to do is, first of all, I look at what their injury and their niggles and their injury patterns are. So I start with that. Um, for strength, some of my favorites. Um, so I look at Pro, things that are going to give proprioception or balance, so that single leg stability, um, the hip stability, um, things that will give range across the joints as well. So I talk about range versus stretching. Um, biomechanics, things that, that are going to help their biomechanics. So some of my favorites are, as far as the strength goes, would be things like split squats or rear lunges, split squats, single leg squats, um, single leg leg press and double leg leg press, uh, squats and deadlifts, and quite a bit of hamstring and glute work as well. The way I'd can, periodize can you it. Can you, can you give a couple of examples yep. of hamstring and glute exercises that you, that you like? So when we look at glute, I look at um, glute max as well as glute med. So glute med is more of a hip stabilizer. So some of my favorites are um, sort of bent knee side planks with uh, the top leg doing a an abduction, um, monster walks if they do it well, uh, a wall mini squat where you're pushing against the wall with your knee so you're abducting while you're doing a mini squat, um, hip hitches or coming out of a Romanian, a single leg deadlift and making sure that the, you get a bit of a hip hitch at the end so that that glute meat activates. Um, some of my favorite glute max ones, I've got a nice, uh, I've got a kickback machine, which is just a, basically where you're kicking straight back. It's like, um, if you can imagine yourself, um, push the push back and running, um, you can look at your floor exercises like supine single leg hip lifts. Um, if I did squat wise, I usually would pre-activate the glutes and then I'd work with your basic squats, goblet squats are great because you might get a bit more glute activation. Um, any other? Uh, those, those are those are all great. Those are all great. Uh, yeah. So so yeah, carry on with uh, okay. then perhaps yeah yeah where, where you yeah. were left off. 
Good. So I, I always have a glute component, and those are some of my favorites. And then working into, if I look at hamstring and look at triathletes, again, I'm looking at the bike run. So some of my favorites, Swiss ball hamstring curls, and there's lots of varieties on that. So you can do a bridge and a curl, or you do a curl and a knee drive, or you just do curls for cyclists. I tend to do less stability work for cyclists. Um, I like a seated machine hamstring curl and I often do single leg because especially at the end of the season people there'll be a right left difference so I'll try and balance out both those sides um, one of my favorites for runners is Romanian or a single leg deadlift with lots of there's lots of variety you can do kettlebell switches you can have a barbell you can do it off the basu so there's a higher level of stability required um, and any kickbacks or hip thrusts as well. And then when you start looking at biking, uh, you can't really go wrong. Uh, split squat I use for biking and for running because it's got the range component and that could move into Bulgarian squat for runners with that rear leg up if they've got the range. Um, so it's got the range, it's got the single leg, uh, you're doing more work with that front leg. Um, and that's the same with single leg squats as well. So I tend to do a, a, a wide variety of single leg squats. But for cyclists, I always include leg press. A good uh, single leg leg press, usually a 45 degree leg press if possible. Um, and then double leg with just lots of weight. Yeah. And uh, let's get into the discussion around weights. So, so in those types of exercises that are uh, weighted, uh, like the leg press, the squats, the deadlift and so on, is your what, what is your philosophy around that, around uh, weight and uh, reps uh, and rep ranges, generally speaking? Uh, is it more of a heavy weight, low reps, or the other way around? Or, or does it depend on the phase of the season? Can you go into that a bit? Yeah, so I definitely periodize the season. Um, and, of course, there's a lot of individual variation that goes in as well. But generally, immediately post-season, so at the start of the off-season, we prioritize rehab, unilateral work, which is single leg work to try and balance sides, range, because often people, athletes may come out of their season a bit tight, and sometimes that can affect mechanics as well as perhaps injury risk, um, and then core and glutes. Um, and so the lifts, I'll still put in some of those lifts I'm talking about, but the focus will be more on single arm, single leg um, and balancing up sides. It's going to be a bit lighter and it might even be a bit more what I call strength endurance. So higher reps, lower weights. And then as we progress through that, through the off season, getting closer to the main season, we will then move from perhaps um, 12 to 15 reps into six to eight reps with heavier weights. One thing I find with a lot of endurance athletes compared to, say, the skiers I work with is that because they're generally not doing as much because they need to swim, bike, run as well, is that often their core isn't strong enough to really load the squats, the deadlifts up. Um, so I will still have them do it because it's important for core but i often find that for example for cyclists the loading will probably be with the leg press um, some box jumps and then one thing we haven't talked about is i would never do any of this um, without the biking and running so i put um, power work on the bike on the trainer um, and then for running of course we're doing the various uh, running and drills and hills and whatnot as well yeah yeah perfect and uh what about the actual execution of a lift uh in terms of whether it is explosive or uh, do you have any uh, any any guidelines around that generally i start i often start trying to get the glutes involved to make sure that people aren't missing the glutes and perhaps over dominating through the quads on a split squat or something so in the early stage it's Mechanically, it's done very well with maybe a pause and then power and tension on the way up. Um, more power I'd get through. We do a few, we do some box jumps, not heaps, but more of the explosive power I'd actually get for cyclists on the bike with their power work. And I find that's a much safer way to go. Um, 
But then as we get closer as, and the weight gets heavier and the reps get a little bit lower, we move into what we call a power intention. So they often laugh because if they're doing a split squat, I'll say explode up. So I'll down and pause and explode up. And often by the time they've done their training, they don't feel very explosive, but we know the power intention will help the power delivery. So we still work on it. Got it. Yeah. And, uh, and and, and this, this, the single leg uh, and single arm work that you described doing a lot of early in the season, is that something that you maintain uh, throughout the periodization of the strength training so that you still have that later on? Or, or does it more morph into uh, double leg, then more heavy work? Or what, what does that look like? We will, as we progress through the season, we'll do less just single leg and we'll more maintain. But for example... We'll see some athletes will always have a deficit between right and left sides, depending some just do normally and others because of injury. So, for example, we would morph into more double leg. But if someone's left leg, which is more typical, someone's left hamstring is weaker than their right. And we're doing hamstring cur curls and we moved into heavier hamstring curls for a cyclist, for example, then I would still do a set of left and then a set of double. Um, and same with the leg press. If someone has a weak, they're weaker on one side, we might still, we would always still keep in touch with either a split squat or a single leg squat or a single leg leg press, but I would do more of the double. But if they have that significant difference between sides, then even right through the season, we would do that the weak side and then we do double if we're moved to our double phase. Right. And, and as for how to uh, combine the strength training with the triathlon training and endurance training, what are your recommendations there? Do you like to do it, for example, uh, in the evening after a hard workout in the morning or maybe on a day when you have uh, an easy day, like an easy endurance day, but hard strength training? Uh, maybe what is the, the significance of the, the type of endurance training you have the day after? Do you like to do the strength training before an easy day or before a hard day? Can you elaborate on that a bit? Yeah, so it just so for people that haven't done a lot is often when you start, it will affect your legs for training. But if you do it regularly, it, it affects them less. But generally, I generally find I often do strength later in the day, like in the afternoon, um, more often than not for my triathletes. Uh, again, it depends on their strengths and weaknesses and what they need. But in general, I'd say more often than not, um, they will do their their um, training, most of their specific training um, in the morning, and then strength would be later in the afternoon. Um, there are some athletes, if bike power is a, a very much a limiter, then sometimes I actually do a bit of what we call power conversion, if it can work out, or potentiation, I suppose, which is where they do their leg, their bike-specific leg strength, and then they get on the trainer and do power work. And I would put that together in a power day if that's higher priority for them. Mm, so, so then essentially you want them to be as fresh as possible to get as much as possible out of the, the strength session, thereby doing it doing it first. Is that right? Yes. And, and, and also get some potentiation, potentiation for the, the bike work potentially. Yes. And what I found is if they were doing power work, and I call power work 20 to 30 second repeats, I'd only ever do that in their off season, not um, coming leading into races. But if they were doing that, then what they find is once they get used to it, Believe it or not, the leg strength doesn't, it almost helps their power. It doesn't necessarily dampen their power. Yeah. When it comes to, to muscle soreness that, uh, as you said, you can have, especially when you're get first getting into strength training or you haven't done it in a long time, uh, what do you find are is a reasonable timeline to expect to not have that anymore? And what are the most important factors in terms of minimizing it? For example, is it the total total tonnage that you that, that you lift in a session or or maybe it's more related to the to the the intensity or the repetitions can can you discuss that a little bit i think the most important thing because i see this mistake being made all the time is that that you ease into your strength work um, and you start with lighter weights higher reps um, so if you do that and progress gradually you're going to have a lot less setbacks in that regard um, 
The other thing I, I try and do, and I experimented when I was working with snow sports and we are doing max testing, but oftentimes if people are complaining of in the early days of their legs having a bit of DOMS, in general, it will happen if you don't lift for 7 to 14 days. So if you can get to strength a 7 or a 10-day training cycle, once you get over the f- first couple weeks, generally you're, the way I do my strength or I prescribe it, generally they're not going to have the DOMS that they'll have early unless they take two or three weeks off and come back to it, and then they will have the DOMS again. So if you can be fairly consistent, it's a lot better than um, missing a few weeks and coming back and trying to make up for it. The other thing that helps is biking. If you had an easy bike um, and you put it after your strength, if that was the way your program worked, I often find biking or swimming will actually decrease DOMS after. So it just loosens up your muscles. So I've even put, after strength testing, I've put a swim, an easy recovery swim after, and then had people report that their DOMS were almost non-existent the next day. Um, Mm, Other than that, if it's in your off season, I wouldn't worry too much about it. But the idea is, is that's why I say sometimes the difference between perception of a strength and conditioner, you shouldn't have a lot of DOMS every time you do strength especially if you're an endurance athlete yeah no definitely the the endurance sport should be the the, the strength work is there to support the endurance work so, uh, exactly. so that makes makes a lot of sense um let's uh, discuss a little bit around around uh, how much strength work uh, you should be doing based on c- kind of your time commitment to uh, to training so i assume that you are uh, programming things differently between your pros versus an amateur would maybe a lot of time to train, let's say 12 to 15 hours a week and a time crunch amateur would maybe five to seven hours per week to train. So, so how might strength training and the amount of strength training done be different between those different categories or demographics? Yeah, that's always a hard question. Do you have time for a fourth discipline? Um, And then we often wade into that. And what I find is, I find that it's just so valuable in not getting the niggles that it actually across the board helps everyone, especially if you've got a history of having lower back or knee problems, et cetera. So if you can work it in, I find that it's very valuable. What I tend to do is have what I call an insurance policy. So for those that really don't have the time and really swim, bike, run is absolutely important and biomechanically they're good they've not really got injured then I would just insert perhaps some core and range uh, which might be 10 to 15 minutes after your short runs and then that's that's your insurance policy because often that will at least keep the niggles away Um, if you're looking to incorporate strength I still find that the value comes in you could stretch it to about two two per 10 days or two per seven day cycle, depending on what type of um, cycle you're on. I find that the athletes that just do it once a day, once a week, or once every 10 days, I find that they often keep getting sore again. But in saying that, if that's all you have, uh, a decent session once every seven days, I still find people get gains and perhaps it's an, also an insurance policy with the heavier strength as well i would just lighten up so you don't get the dom so it doesn't affect your uh, bike running as much yeah and a session there a typical session in in that context being 45 to 60 minutes or so is that right yeah and i tend to superset um again which is often different than some of the traditional strengths so for example i might um i might put your squats with some core work so you you know and you just keep moving around so you're not resting in between sets so you can get quite a bit done in a 45 minute session yeah all right well let's move on from strength training and uh, here i'm going to let you choose a one discipline swim bike or run uh, and of of your of your choice and you can give two to three tips or strategies or tactics that you think tend to to improve athletes performance in in that discipline let's say that they might be stuck at a bit of a plateau in that discipline and and don't really know what to do next to improve so choose one and then go for it right okay um so i looking at biking because probably i've got the most experience with 
um, trying to bring the levels ups in through the bike. Um, I think biking's fairly a simple sport, but what I do is I'd get you to look at what your volume is off season, what your volume is off season, what your volume is in season and what intensity you're doing. So I would look at that and I'd really dissect everything that you were doing as a cyclist. I'd ask what your weaknesses are. For example, some athletes climb really well, but they don't have the, the power on the flats. Some people vice versa. They might do really well on the flats and not climb well. So we'd look at that. We look at your base riding and what zone are you in? And this is a, um, this is very, um, a bit controversial now about what zone and how much training you're doing in that zone. And I have my theories about where I think you make a lot of, you'll make a lot of gains. So we basically dissect what you're doing. And then I'd ask you, are you doing, do you need to improve your biking? In which case, um, inserting bike blocks in your off season. Because oftentimes a lot of people will work on what they need to work at coming into their triathlon, but often they then find that the gains seem to come about six months later. So you really do need to work it into your off season, finding out what your weaknesses are and work on them. And to be honest, if, if someone has the time and biking is quite weak, then I would see if I can get them up to 10 to 12 hours a week on the bike, which for some age groupers might feel that's almost all their training time. But if you can get a block of six to eight weeks in the off season, you'll find your biking just gets to that next level. Um, and then I'd break down the power equation. So when you look at power, and I'm not talking about sprinting, I'm talking about what your power is for your a 70.3 or your Ironman or your Olympic distance triathlon um, <clears throat> and look at the power equation actually breaks down into the force you're putting through the pedal times your cadence. Um, so then we look at sometimes I find that when we really break it down, some people just have never developed a full range of cadences. So they're, they're stuck when it comes time to actually having to find different gears. Whereas I find other athletes, um, force uh, depends on what they're doing they might be soft pedaling a lot in their off season because they're training in zone one not zone two um what are they doing for their intervals are they climbing um and then are they doing strength so that comes down to are you doing strength on the bike but also are you doing strength in the gym which can give that force um portion of your power equation a little nudge in the off season um and then i'd also look at in the gym is are you what I call firing on all, all cylinders. So we know, for example, with biking, we know most of us put a lot of um, power into the down part of the pedal stroke. But are you actually pulling through the bottom of the pedal stroke? What's your hamstring gastroc um, strength like? How's your posterior chain? There's a bit of, you know, glutes need to work, but some people get a little bit um, over the top with glutes, but are your glutes helping and are you firing on all cylinders? And I find often perhaps cyclists that can't quite get to that next level, um, they might be just very quad dominant and they're not actually in a good position to use all the muscles they have access to. And they might be weak in a particular muscle. So we investigate that and try and bring it all together. How, how would you investigate that? Uh, because uh, it could potentially be that they're weak or they don't know how to activate those muscles or it could be that the position on the bike is maybe suboptimal and it doesn't allow them to to really activate those uh, those muscles so so how do you know which one which one it is do you would you have them go to a bike fitter or yes so as far as bike fit i've looked at that a lot and we can do all all the work in the world but if your bike fit isn't right you're probably not firing in all cylinders but i would send them to a a good bike fitter. Um, but then I would do, I've done lots of strength testing with my time with triathlon and all the sports I've worked with. So posterior chain, there's some, there's quite a few isolation strength tests you can do. And cause I've put some of the New Zealand's best triathletes through, um, those tests, I have a pretty good idea, um, to, as to breaking it down and seeing if the hamstrings are, are not working well, or if the glutes aren't firing well. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, and one thing you mentioned there about uh, training, doing your endurance work in the right zone. Uh, can you elaborate a bit on on that? Uh, because you said you have your theories around uh, where you should do your your endurance work. Yes, and um, 
that's the question. Do we get into the physiological testing or do I just, just a maybe real we can, basic? Yeah, maybe, maybe we can get into the physiological testing because we have that next on, on our list. So so let's let's do that. Uh, so yeah, start by uh, talking about the testing that you prefer to use and and why and then i'm sure we'll get into we'll get into that as the conversation progresses yes um and a lot of it too i find is how much volume people are doing so when we talk about training in certain zones um we'll talk about that a little bit more there's something that used to be called no man zone which was temple but now it's embraced a little bit more with runners for example but um often if you're training high volume you'll spend a lot more time in the lower zones, like what I'd say E1 is. But if those athletes are quite time poor, then they probably can spend a a bit more time in those upper upper aerobic tempo zones. So again, you have to massage it as a coach as well, Um, which brings me into the testing. So I've developed, I've done lots of testing, VO2 max, lactate testing, many different Many different disciplines, cyclists, runners, Nordic skiers, triathletes, swimmers, rowers. And when I left the university, um, I didn't have access to a gas analyzer. But the other thing I found with testing is that um, some of the tests that you can do um, didn't necessarily, for the money that the athletes spent, it it didn't give them what I felt um, they were paying for. So what I did was I developed, I took all the lactate testing I was doing and I could afford a lactate analyzer. And so I've made, I've continued with lactate testing and I mostly do bikers, cyclists and runners, although I've done other sports as well. And I've moved the testing into five minute incremental progressive lactate test. Um, But when I do it, the five minute stages are to try and get steady state lactate more so than some of the shorter stages that I used to test on. So that when test retest, we know that there's, it's the lactate is actually at a, a pretty close to being a steady state. Um, but then I also video them as they're doing it. So I look at their biomechanics. Um, I observe that steady state testing. It might take by the time you get testing 35 to 40 minutes, but it gives me that time to observe how they move their biomechanics, what their cadence is, uh, running, what their turnover is, and really sort of have a good look at them. Um, And then I've developed, I've actually, in conjunction with some of the research we had done um, back in the Aussie Institute of Sport and in Otago, I've got a five zone system. So, and it's based on lactate. So my zone one is basically under under lactate threshold. And my zone two starts at lactate threshold. And I spend a lot of time um, because metabolically, a lot of changes happen. We're, we're just, in zone- just, to, just to clarify here for the listeners, we're talking about the, the first lactate threshold, LT1, or the aerobic yes. threshold, as some people call it. Yes. And so my zone two starts starts at the end, starts at lactate threshold and goes up. And then zone three is your tempo or strength endurance, as we call it. Um, zone four is your anaerobic threshold and zone five is VO2 max. Got it. Yeah. And uh, so so then uh, with those zones defined, uh, I, I guess that this is a good place to lead into what you were thinking around, like where should the endurance training be be done for most athletes, or although it depends on the volume, as you said. Yeah, depends on the volume. But And I, I suppose the, a lot of the athletes I coach sit around, uh, again, your age groupers might be 12 to 16 hours. Um, then we look at 20, may, uh, maybe 25 hours. Um, but I tend to not, um, I tend to put in uh, some intensity as well. So that being said, I do like to spend significant time in zone two, so out of zone one. Um, and what I find with a lot of athletes, and I call it soft pedaling, if your volume is not through the roof, which some athletes are, but if your volume sort of moderate, I think quite a few athletes spend more time in E1 than what I think they need to be. So I look at that quite closely and I've had really good results from just warming up through E1, but then doing blocks in that E2. And E2 on my testing is quite a big zone. 
what might a uh, power range be for for e2 if you give an example or a heart rate range in ah, uh, just just yeah. just in ter- just in terms of how how big it is and of course the power will really depend on on the capacity of the athlete it's very different yes. if somebody has an anaerobic threshold of 400 versus 200 watts there but yes but yes, if you give yes. an example so heart the heart rate zone often is 15 to 20 beats range yeah yeah, yeah. So that's pretty big yeah it is so again what we'll we'll do um so e1 mm-hmm. comes into e2 but then often i'll try and get them to do blocks like say four times 15 minute at mid to high e2 and high e2 ends just at um about 10 beats, five to 10 beats under their anaerobic threshold. And I call that zone a tempo or a strength endurance zone. Mm, yeah. Yeah, got it. Okay. That, that, that makes, that makes sense. Um, and uh, let me see here. What about, so, so can you discuss how, like, is, is how field tests might be useful or how they might not be useful what what are the pros and cons of, of doing lactate testing uh, like you described for example uh, versus just doing field tests different the different field tests that exists and and if an athlete for some reason doesn't have the option to do a lactate testing what field tests might be the best ones to choose from yes um so they've there's a lot since I started, which was I started testing in '95. There's been a lot of good field tests that are out there. Um, FTP, of course, um, the critical power testing. Those are all good ones. But I find, to be honest, FTP is pretty easy to do, and there's all there's lots of protocols out there. But I really like the 20 minute FTP um, test. And for runners, there's various running tests as well so sometimes you know it's a warm-up and you run up a gradual hill for seven minutes as fast as you can to get a max heart rate um there's a 5k time trial which is also quite a nice test once you warm up um so i think the pros and cons one with the lactate testing that i've done for me as a coach because i've correlated it to training and performance for so many years by actually seeing the lactate um I get almost like a little snapshot into muscle metabolism. So for me, that's where I get to see a lot more than a field test. But in saying that, we often will do a lactate test. And then if they're expensive, um, so then I might put some field testing in and not retest lactate again until either we really need to explain something um, and just use field tests in the meantime. Um, So... Yeah, lactate testing is can be expensive and you want the person to do it, you want them to really have a good handle on not only the physiology, but also perhaps coaching as well. So that's quite valuable. Um, and and heart rate wise, you get very much more accurate zones with the lactate testing than you do on a field test. So most of the field tests are looking at um, giving you an estimation based on generally based on VO2 max or based on lactate testing and it's an estimation so it's they're pretty good but they're not as accurate as if you go in and get a lab test um in saying that motivation has a lot to do with it so in it and it, for example an FTP test on in biking is that motivation has a lot to do with it whereas either a VO2 max or a lactate test you'll know if they finished early by the variables that you can see yeah no, absolutely. And and the good thing about a lactate test uh, is uh, when you're getting those heart rate zones, those don't, even though the power zones might change a lot, the heart rate zones don't really change that much. So you, you can use that for quite a long time and then just see your power go up uh, at those heart rates. So so when you're, you're really using all the information that you have at your uh, disposal, then uh, then yeah, you can really make one test, which is, of course, an investment, but you can make it last for quite a long time until you have to retest yes. again. Yes. And one of the things I wanted to remind people is I see now with power and GPS is I see some people are ditching heart rate. And I think it heart rate just gives you so much more information. And like you say, accurate heart rate zones will last for quite a while. Whereas if you're 
testing and looking to prescribe power or run velocity from that, those will change in as little as six to eight to weeks, but, uh, depending on your training. So you have to keep retesting them. And then motivation comes into play, as well as other as training fatigue as well. Yep. So let's uh, discuss nutrition a bit, which you mentioned as your uh, one of your top three uh, pieces of advice. Uh, and uh, and in our email conversation, we discussed that a bit as well. So tell us what your thoughts are around nutrition, uh, both in the just general day to day, and but also around specifically fueling training and fueling workouts. Uh, so yeah, just to go ahead and, and discuss your thoughts. Great. So. As I think you'll agree, nutrition, I call it, it's a minefield, it's a religion, and um, it can be very confusing. And I've been, 1985 is when I started uh, with the eat to win theory of diet, which was high carbohydrate. So basically in in the years, nutrition has changed and it's you have to be very careful with it. And what I say when people ask me about the latest trend is I say, well, do you have diabetes? Is, you know, is that diet for that works well for diabetes for an athlete? Is are you a 50-year-old office worker? Does that suit you uh your diet? So I think the most important advice is to you need to see a qualified nutritionist with an endurance specialty if you're looking for advice. Um because endurance is different from regular sport nutrition. And nutrition and all the diets out there, they have um, their place based on what people are looking at. But sport nutrition is really quite important. And probably the biggest problem I've seen in the last might be seven years is the low car, the LCHF, low carb training, low um, for Ironman athletes and long distance triathletes. Um, metabolically the research looks quite good and athletes have been using it cyclists and runners have been using it for years but when you look at triathlon what we're now seeing is a lot of athletes went on it they might have stripped weight they might have felt good but we're now seeing on the other side the energy deficiency and the bone health um, and the injuries that are coming with it so not saying that you don't do any of it but you, i think you need to approach it very carefully and you need to look at when you use it and when you don't, because I find a lot of triathletes are just blanketly um, training low for a lot of their training. They're not able to get into zones above their aerobic zone. And um, again, it's a bit controversial, but I believe that they need to be doing, they need to get into threshold, do some threshold training and strength endurance training. And if they're not eating enough, they're not going to get there. It's going to compromise them. Mm. So do, do you think that uh, not eating enough is uh, is also, I, I guess, one of the big problems that you see just generally maybe not getting in enough? And, and do you think that's um, maybe a subconscious uh, sub subconscious thing for athletes or, or do you think it's actually just that it's it's so difficult to to eat enough when you're training a lot that people are not even aware that they're not re not at all meeting the requirements of uh, of how much they should be eating. Yeah, I think it depends where you live. I know in New Zealand we've had um we've had a few sport nutritionists or nutritionists um really pushing the low carb high fat to a lot of our long distance triathletes starting a few years ago. And so I think they were following that trend um and that was a conscious decision, but long distance triathletes it's just it's really hard to eat enough by the time you factor in your work and your training um, and organizing your nutrition. So we have a theory that long distance triathletes are probably training low anyways without limiting their carbs and what they're yep. eating. Yeah. So does that uh, would you say that uh, this also applies to, you know, this uh, conversation that I've had actually with some athletes uh, to not. Yeah, but basically <laughs> to kind of avoid the training low even if training low might is not necessarily a deliberate like emptying the glycogen stores but just training fasted i guess and i but actually it's a conversation i had with several athletes uh, around like always having at least something before they do their morning workout if they're training at a reasonable training load uh, because i just find like you that to be able to get the quality even if it's not something super hard but even just zone two training i find that 
you have a better quality zone two workout if you if you have something for most athletes and uh, so is that something that you would say as well or, or what's your thought around that around training training fasted so that's a can of worms in itself and i have had some athletes and i was will definitely willing i am willing to try it but then i would um maybe once or twice a week they might train fasted and we have tried it i don't know what their muscle metabolism looks like because i don't have a microscope um but I am seeing so many bone density problems um, and iron deficiency in females that I really don't believe it's a good idea, particularly for females. And I think perhaps maybe some of the male athletes will get away with it, um, but I wouldn't do it very often. So if someone's very adamant that that's what they want to do, then I'll watch them very closely. Um, and then, like I say, I'd only program in um, – just their low intensity training and it might be one or two sessions a week yeah yeah i i also changed my thinking on on this because still a year ago i think i i did with some athletes program in actual like glycogen depleted training with a high intensity session in the evening and then uh, maybe not having much carbohydrate for uh, after that workout and then doing a fasted workout in the morning but my just anecdotal experience was that we didn't see that much benefit from it and then the risk benefit ratio which is something i really like to use as a tool just always assessing the risk benefit ratio of something uh, it just isn't there it just way skews way towards the risk side rather than the benefit side so so that's why i kind of stopped stopped using that i yeah i'd agree with you then if we move on to sort of race nutrition and in particular for long distance triathlon, uh, what are your thoughts around that? Um, so I often ask people if they're completing it or they're competing. So the completers, the one, the, the people that want to do it to get to the finish line and have a good time, they can often, I believe, um, have more mixed foods. So more fat, protein, and carbohydrate in their race nutrition. They might find that their fluid intake is could be a little bit lower. Um, so they might get away with 300, you know, 300 mils an hour um, on the run and maybe 500 mils on the bike. Um, and they might eat every 30 to 45 minutes. So perhaps we're looking at 50 to 60 grams an hour, especially if their stomachs don't handle a lot of food. But I find those that are competing, so trying to get a PB, get on the podium, um, I find that I tend to start at about 60 grams, and I tend to prescribe mostly by carbs. Um, and for some, I have prescribed, we have looked at going up to over one gram per kilo body weight. So we have looked at that, and some athletes tolerate it, and some don't. Um, but we've, you know, we visited it anyways. Um, and then on the bike, generally, I look at about a bottle an hour um, in a hot Ironman race um, or 70.3. And the smaller athletes might get away with 500 mils. And I've even had some of the bigger athletes that have tried and find that they're always thirsty. They've gone with a liter an hour and been fine with it. But um, for the most part, I find about a bottle an hour is good. And I still am finding that some athletes like to have uh, carbs in their sport drink, uh, in their bottles, and other athletes prefer to have gels with water. And I haven't really noticed a difference other than convenience. Yeah. Have you or have any of your athletes uh, been using hydrogel type uh, products like Morton or similar? And have you found that that has been helpful, maybe perhaps for athletes that have had uh, GI issues in the past? Yeah. So a lot of my athletes have tried everything and I do find it's a bit personal, but Morton of course came out um, with the sub two hour, didn't it? And uh, I did have an athlete who tried Morton in a triathlon and he got cramps for the first time ever on the bike, stomach cramps, um, and had gastric problems with it, which was interesting. Um, but he has no troubles with it for running. But in saying that, so he'll now, for example, use Morton, but he'll often use something else on the bike and Morton on the run. And he's never had a, he's, he's performed very well with it. Mm. Yep. Then, uh, continuing on with the racing theme, but going to sort of pacing and pace planning, 
how did something you also mentioned there that you have done testing with and and done some correlations uh, in time trials in cycling but for triathlon how do you recommend that, that athletes come like how do you help them with the race planning what, what is that based on is it based on workouts or uh, lab testing or can you tell us about that yeah so when we do when we do the original lactate testing of course we get accurate heart rate zones and accurate power or running on the flat um, velocity zones and then um, so we use those zones and i find heart rate zones really do stay very steady but of course the power and the velocity is going to change over the season um, and i find with the testing i do and again everyone does their own testing but what I've worked with is for a, sh um, a 70.3 distance, most of our athletes can bike and run in what I call E3. Okay. And I often, so what we do is we do a lot of training of blocks in E3. And then of course we look at what their power is closer to that time on the bike. And then same with running. We'll look at doing, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll find the heart rate in saying that over training once we do all our blocks of training and race pace work, we're going to have a pretty accurate idea, but that's where we start from. Um, and then uh, for long distance for Ironman, I find if an athlete eats really well and, and their nutrition and hydration spot on and they don't have any cramping, then usually they can bike and run in on the higher end of E2. So again, we do blocks, blocks of Ironman pace um, in their long rides as we get closer to the race. So by race day, they really have a good idea of what their heart rate and what their um, power would be. And I tend not to be too strict about it because, as you know, some days you're going to have days and you're going to be at the high end of your power and other days you're going to struggle and be at the low end of your power. So we massage it a little bit and give them a range. If they feel good, this will be your heart rate and power range. Obviously, near the end of the race, a lot of people's power is going to drop down. Um, so we look at both both heart rate and power, but then I also never lose track of personal feel because you're always going to get athletes that enter a race and their GPS doesn't work on the start. And so you want them to have just a good feel for it as well. Yeah. Do you find with heart rate that it's still quite applicable on race day? Because that is something that I I do find that sometimes heart rate just due to adrenaline and maybe being super fresh and tapered for a race and uh, perhaps caffeine intake to load up on caffeine before the race and all, all these factors that, that heart rate on race day might not uh, necessarily be a perfect reflection of what you've done in training or, or testing, but, but you still think it's worthwhile, it's not that far off? Well, that's a good point. We take it with a grain of salt as we do everything. So it's a good guideline. But I found at the start of a bike, at the start of the bike, heart rate will be elevated. So we ignore it for about the first 20 Ks. And then I find that generally it settles. And I found it to be pretty accurate. Um, heat might be a little higher if it's a hot day. Um, but in general, it's I find it within the ballpark. And the only time that on the run, it will drop is especially if someone is cramping or if they haven't had enough nutritionally, then you'll see that slow drop as they go and they'll end up being sort of E1 or low E1. And of course, that's a different situation. But for the most part, I, I don't find it too bad once you get past the first 20 Ks of the bike. Yeah, no, yeah, that, that makes makes sense. And and I do agree with that with, with heart rate on the bike, the first 20 K. Uh, from the swim and everything it can be quite elevated but then it's it does seem to settle um i think uh that was about it for for racing i just have one more question before we go into the rapid fire questions and that is if you could go back let's say 10 years in time and give yourself some advice uh to your co to yourself as a coach what would you what would you tell yourself oh i didn't prepare for these ones um The relationship, I think the coach-athlete relationship is the most important, whereas in the early days, I probably got caught up in sports science too much, too serious about the sports science. And I've learned now to use the sports science, but also work on the relationship. 
All right, perfect. Now uh, let's move into the rapid fire questions. So these are just one sentence answers. And the first question is, what's your favorite book, blog, or resource related to triathlon or endurance sports? I'd have to say I'm going back to the Joe Friel Triathletes Training Bible. Classic. Yeah. And uh, next, what's your favorite piece of gear or equipment? Well, to be honest, myself, my specialized mountain bike. Perfect. And what's a personal habit that's helped you achieve success? Attention to detail and probably being an overachiever. All right. And uh, finally, where can people find out more about you and your coaching business, uh, web address and social media and so on? So my website has not been updated for years, but it's got a bit of a skeleton. It's uh, valberk.com. Um, and Facebook, same thing. It's Reach Your Peak, Val Burke and Co. Um, Instagram, same thing. Yeah. Right. And you're located uh, down in Wanaka on the South Island of New Zealand yes. for people that might want to come in for a test or something. Uh, yes, we are here. We'll open our country up hopefully at the end of the year. Yeah, yeah. But we have New Zealand listeners of this podcast, so there might be somebody ah. that are already eligible for, for it. <laughs> yes. Yes, we get lots of people down through Wanaka, and I love meeting new people, so it'd be great to test you. All right. Well, thank you so much, Val. Uh, it was great to chat to you, and uh, have a great, uh, great evening. Good. Thanks very much. I hope you enjoyed that interview with Val. As always, you can find the show notes on scientifictriathlon.com with links to Val's website and social media pro profiles, as well as links to the category archives for some of the specific topics we discussed today, including strength training, bike training, and racing. On Thursday, we have another TTS Thursday episode coming out. And next Monday, there will be an interview with coach Björn Gesman, who is uh, a German coach who coaches, among others, Patrick Lange and Katharina Matthews. So two athletes that are doing really well at the moment in Ironman Tulsa. We saw Patrick Lange uh, really destroy the field and Kat Matthews what. Kat Matthews was second only to Daniela Riff, so a really great result for her. And uh, yet the discussion with Bjorn was, uh, was a really good one, so I hope that you tune in for that one as well. If you're looking to take your training to the next level, uh, do consider looking at our offerings in terms of services and products with coaching, customized plans, and ready-made training plans. No matter what your goals are and what your budget is and so on, we try to have, uh, have options for, for every single person there. So check it out on scientifictriathlon.com. Finally, big thanks to our sponsors, Roka, that you can find on roka.com. Check out their wetsuits, trisuits, swimskins, goggles, high-performance eyewear, and prescription glasses and sunglasses, and get 20% off your order with the promo code that you can get on roka.com forward slash TTS. And thank you to Sen8, that you can find on sen8swimtrainer.com. Use the swim trainer to improve your technique, power, and stamina, and increase your swim stimulus frequency, even on days when you don't have enough time to go and do a full session in the pool or in the open water. And get 20% off your swim trainer with a promo code that you can get on zenateswimtrainer.com forward slash TTS. Thank you, as always, for listening. Keep training smart and keep loving triathlon.